I'm reading from the New International Version in case my version is a little different what you will see. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's where Jesus tells us who our neighbor is and how we are to be neighbors to them and one another. So here now the good news. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied, how do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so the lawyer asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. I'm a storyteller. I actually have a doctorate in storytelling, which is a little unusual. It's a spiritual storytelling. So I'm going to tell you stories today. The first one is about Mr. Rogers. Anybody remember Mr. Rogers? He came onto the scene in the late 60s, early 70s. And my oldest daughter got to watch him every day. He was a Presbyterian minister, by the way. He had all kinds of ideas for young children. But his ideas were different than the things happening, if you remember, in history during the 60s and early 70s. So this sweet, sappy, smart program stayed in production until 2001 and actually was still on um, TV until 2008. So lots of you could have come across him. Every time he came into the studio, he would sing, It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. And while he was singing, he would tie on his sneakers and zip up his cardigan He always wore a cardigan. And then he would sing the last line. And I don't sing, so I'm going to read it. Won't you be, won't you be, won't you be my neighbor? And the whole program then was about who was neighbor and who um, was to react in a certain way to different people. Not necessarily the way people were reacting. Now that's the concept of neighborliness. When I grew up, it was out in the country, so our neighbors weren't real close. But whenever we needed anything, we knew we could go to those neighbors for help. When we got together, it was usually for something like building a barn. You've heard of barn raising. There were also quilting bees, although I didn't participate in those times to can, times to harvest, and it was all done as a community. And the community wasn't a small geographical area. It could be 20 miles in circle. But because 
farmers knew one another. That was their community. But it started to change as people moved into cities or towns. And then communities became who lived next door or right down the street or who you worked with or who your family was. And neighborhoods got separated by all kinds of things. Remember the citywide um, designation of there's Greek town and there's the Irish place and then there's Little Italy. We still have that in Baltimore. We still have some of these other areas too. And then the baby boom happened and suburbs happened. Most of us probably live in what could be considered a suburb. They circled the towns and community became your little block or your little residential space or whatever where you lived was called. And friends were next door and friends were around the corner but they weren't far off. Prefabricated neighborhoods could be very lonely places, especially if you didn't get along with the neighbor next door. So when Jesus asked this, um, they say legal expert, lawyer, what his idea of um, neighbor is. He's telling them, uh, everyone's your neighbor. He tells the story of the Good Samaritan. You noticed it was the priest who walked on the other side and the Levite who was a higher up too. The folks you would expect to respond didn't. We did a youth thing once where the priest said he was late for a meeting and the Levite said he had to get home because his wife had picked, sent him to pick up bread. And the Samaritan. The Samaritan is the one that Jesus says is a righteous man. He's a rich man because he has the money to take care of the injured man. He has connections because he knows where, what hotel to go and how to get him treatment when he's no longer with him. And yet the Samaritan is the one that the priest and the Levite and all the good people would have called the outsider, the not neighbor, the one to be suspicious of because he was from Samaria, not from their neighborhood. So in this story, Jesus puts up all kinds of Rich and poor, redemption and rejection, a glorified entrance into Jerusalem and the God-awful ending at Calvary. It's sort of like the sound system, the surround sound. There's always both and, always inclusive. The message of the Good Samaritan parable, at least one of them is, be a good neighbor. Jesus knew we have difficulty loving our neighbor until we first identified ourselves as the neighbor. Who is our neighbor? Everyone is your neighbor. I love the video because you are going to neighborhoods you're not a part of and being the neighbor to the neighbors in the neighborhood. And I know that you do other kinds of mission work too. But this is a personal one-on-one -on -one thing that Jesus is pointing out to the lawyer. Who is my neighbor? And the answer is, your neighbor is every man, your neighbor is every woman, your neighbor is, simply put, everyone. And the labels that we put on one another to make divisions and to make outsiders is what Jesus did not want us to do. Some of the things in the news that 
at least shook me to the core. That stand your ground rule, and if somebody in your neighborhood doesn't look like your neighbor, it makes them a target. And the court upheld it, and a young man is dead. One of our presidential candidates made news lately by talking about Mexicans like this, as if Mexicans are the only immigrants in the country. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're sending people that have lots of problems. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. And then at the end he says, and some I assume are good people. Jesus would have us start with, some are good people. Most are good people and don't judge because you don't know what category somebody falls into. Neighbors need help, not condemnation. And regardless of what you feel about immigration, both legal and illegal, remember, Jesus starts with the people. And the Bible tells us that all people are created in the image of God. That's where our starting point should be. And then there's a few other things. Did you know that Christ loved Freddie Gray? Wanted him to have a good life? Did not think he deserved to die? Did you know God was in the midst of all that unrest in Baltimore, seeking out the one who was the good Samaritan who would help? Who were the ones who helped and who were the ones who condemned? Did you see pastors in the middle of the city risking their own lives? Most of them were United Methodists, or a good chunk of them were United Methodists. Some lived in those areas, and some came in to help. They took care of the children, and they took care of bringing food, and they tried to help restore some sense of community and neighbor, neighborless. So. Things about that. Did you see the um, gangs working together to keep the police safe and some of the businesses safe? Same gangs who went back to same old, same old the next week, but they were there doing what a neighbor does. Did you see that mama grab up her son and get him out of the fray? That got a lot of TV time. And I just kept thinking, oh, mamas, I wish you were all in there yanking up your sons and daughters. Did you see God weep for all the neighbors on all the sides? I think that the heart of the Good Samaritan is not just about a lesson of who is my neighbor. That was the lawyer's question. But Jesus' response was about how to be a neighbor. Not just to the ones you know, but to everyone you come in contact with. First do, act, love is a verb. So, how do we do that? Ordinary people who try to do good and follow Christ's calling to us. How do we be the neighbor? The church I serve for almost 26 years always ask that question when I preached on this. How can we be neighbors to people we never met? Think about all the good this church already does. Think about the video that you saw shared. Think about all the events that are coming up that you can invite new neighbors into. I saw a story on social media. Yes, I'm one of those people who likes Facebook. Huffington Post ran an article by Lori Weiss called Nine Nanas. Anybody see it? All right, I'm going to tell you the story of Nine Nanas. Nine grandmother types, whether they were real grandmothers or not, used to get together to play cards and gossip. And they got tired of that. I'm not used to a screen. They got tired of that, so one day they were talking about what their grandmother used to do when she found out somebody needed something. She baked them a cake. 
How many of you bake cakes for funerals? This is where this idea came from. So these nine nanas said, let's not keep just playing cards and gossiping. Let's figure out a way that we can use that story. And so late at night or early in the morning, whatever your perspective is, at 4 a.m., across that little town, all those nanas would get together and bake cakes. They used the grandmother's recipe for a good old pound cake. And then they would box them up, and UPS would come get them and take them to who they were meant for. People they'd seen who had had a death in the family, someone was having surgery, they heard somebody was having a hard time, somebody was getting divorced, whatever the reason. And before long, they were sending out 100 of these pound cakes a week. So they sat down and they talked about what they were going to do next. They hired themselves a neighborly consultant. Her code name was Sunny, because you have to be Sunny in order to do that. Her job was to go to the beauty parlor and listen, and then come back with people who needed help. Her job was to do drive-bys in communities that none of them were a part of and notice, like the houses that needed ramps, notice if there was no air conditioning and it was 90 degrees. Uh, notice if there were children playing out front whose clothes were a little less than presentable. Notice if ambulances came and went. Things like that. And got a huge list. And the nine nanas said, that's wonderful, but nine of us can't make that many cakes, so what do we do now? So they started sharing the story, and people wanted to help. Some baked, some got supplies, some helped put them in boxes and tie them up and address them. And before long, a hundred people were part of the Nine Nanas Network. One of the nephews heard about it and decided to make them a web page. And it's there, 9nanas.com, the number nine. And more people were attracted to helping. And so money started to come in. And so they had to have a big, a big bank account. The UPS man kept coming. And remember, they're still baking at 4 AM, and the husbands don't know what's going on. One finally noticed that there was a lot of money coming in and out of the savings account. And so he confronted his wife, and she said, oh, I just bought a few things. And he looked at her with that look that says, fess up, I know something's going on. So she told him. They got all the nanas together, and all the family members of all the nanas together, and it became a family event, a corporation. Everyone trying to find a neighbor to help. They started paying water bills. When power would be turned off, they started doing electric bills. They started seeing who needed hospital uh, coverage. When they went to the grocery store, if they saw a mother with kids in tow putting just two or three things in the cart, they'd take her cart and fill it up and pay for it. The Nine Nanas ministry began with a group of little old ladies, probably my age and older, who were sitting around playing cards and bored to death and gossiping. But look how that got turned around to where they are Christ's good Samaritans. And yes, they went to church and they listened to the joys and concerns and wrote those down too. And they never put their names on it. They just started signing it, the nine nanas. So, who is a good Samaritan in that story? Is it people that you would ordinarily think of that could come up with that big a deal to help other people? You see, I think we are all used to thinking, I can't do anything, I'm just one person. And they were one person plus eight, so nine nanas, and you had to make sure you said that Nana Pearl was in charge because she was the oldest. It took all those people 
doing the little they could, and the ministry now has somewhere in the three or four hundred thousand recipients across the world. It's grown. I don't know that I could be a Nana. I don't bake that well. I burn a lot. But there are other things I can do. And each one of you has that gift that Christ wants you to use, that gift that God has given you to not judge and figure out who's your neighbor, but simply be a neighbor to everyone. Jesus said it best when he told the lawyer, go and do likewise. To God be the glory. Amen.